a patient with asthma or COPD is posted for surgery in your OT. So how are you going to evaluate the patient, manage the patient intraoperatively and what care are you going to take postoperatively? So hello everyone, I welcome you to our first OT clinic session. Myself Dr. Karthik Digutla and I am an anesthesiologist and today let's learn a few important points to remember while dealing with a patient with asthma or COPD. So when the patient comes to PAC, the pre-anesthetic clinic, you need to assess two things. Firstly, the severity of the disease and secondly, does he need any therapy before surgery? Take a detailed history of the patient which must include any recent URTI, upper respiratory tract infections, any triggers or allergies for asthma and any smoking history. Look at the patient pattern of breathing, see if there is any cyanosis or usage of any accessory muscles for breathing. Auscultate the patient and listen for any wheeze or adventitious lung sounds. Remember that in cases of long-standing COPD patients, pulmonary hypertension develops and you might hear a murmur of tricuspid or pulmonary regurgitation. Now how do you distinguish obstructive lung disease from a restrictive lung disease in spirometry? See, in obstructive lung disease like asthma or COPD, the FEV, FEV1 by FVC is decreased due to high airway resistance. Whereas in restrictive lung diseases like pulmonary fibrosis or ankylosing spondylitis, the FEV1 by FVC is normal or sometimes increased due to the FVC is low in these conditions because there is a limited expansion of the lungs or chest wall. Okay. It is also important to obtain an ABG and check the room air saturation of these patients. Now what are the orders you give for this patient in the PAC clinic? The most important is to quit smoking. Smoking cessation for at least 12 hours before surgery is recommended and the best is 6 to 8 weeks before surgery. Postpone surgery if patient has upper respiratory tract infection for at least 2 weeks after clinical recovery of the patient also, especially in children. This is due to high incidence of bronchospasm and laryngospasm in children. Alright, now how would you manage this case intraoperatively? Before induction, use a meter dose inhaler and give 2-3 to three puffs of salbutamol or albuterol to relax the airway smooth muscles. For induction, use propofol or ketamine. I personally use propofol in hemodynamically stable patients than ketamine and I use ketamine for actively wheezing patient. Thiopentone reported to release histamine and it can cause bronchospasm. Here you need to remember one thing, if a patient has already depleted sympathetic reserve like low catecholamines like in a shock state where body is unable to compensate, giving ketamine will not increase BP but it will still worsen the hypotension. Alright, use sevoflurane because desflurane and isoflurane are airway irritants. Coming to muscle relaxant for induction, use cisatrocurium or rocuronium for intubation because they are non-histamine releasing. And give lignocaine IV 1 to 1.5 mg per kg 1 minute or 90 seconds before intubation to pre prevent the reflex bronchospasm. And studies have also shown that a LMA like an LMA prosil that is a supraglottic airway is also beneficial than an ET tube because there is no tracheal manipulation. If it is an emergency surgery, rapid sequence induction with scoline that is succinylcholine or rocuronium 1.2 mg per kg can also be done. Remember that wherever possible, always prefer neuraxial anesthesia or regional anesthesia, especially when it comes to respiratory compromised patients. The main advantage of regional technique is you can avoid airway manipulation, you can lower the risk of bronchospasm and you can put an epidural which can help for post-operative analgesia and also it can reduce the need for post-operative opioids or narcotics. It is also very important to remember that for patients who are dependent on accessory muscles for respiration, high level spinal should be avoided. For maintenance of anesthesia, you can always use sevoflurane or isoflurane. If patient is susceptible for malignant hyperthermia, you avoid succinylcholine or volatile agents. Then you can use propofol which is the most preferred agent. And the muscle relaxant 
Cisetracurium or Vecuronium can be used for maintenance. Remember here that the volatile agents are good bronchodilators by relaxing the airway smooth muscles. They act by decreasing the intracellular calcium. Now what about ventilatory settings in this patient? Avoid high peak inspiratory pressures, especially in patients with emphysema and large blebs, because this can lead to barotrauma and pneumothorax. Keep the peak inspiratory pressures less than 50 cm of water and peak plateau pressures less than 30 cm of water. The inspiratory is to expiratory ratio that is I is to E ratio can be increased to give adequate time for expiration. Remember that in patients with COPD or asthma, there is an outflow obstruction which can cause intrinsic peep or auto peep to develop. This is due to air trapping. So extrinsic peep must be kept lower than intrinsic peep to reduce the work of breathing for the patient. Now the surgery is going on well. But suddenly you can see a rise in the peak inspiratory pressures in the monitor and there is tightening of the bag. Then this is a sign of bronchospasm. What would you do now? Increase FiO2. Deepen the plane of anesthesia. Check for any kinking or obstruction of the tubes. Auscultate for wheeze or any diminished breath sounds on one side or both sides. If bronchospasm is confirmed, increase the concentration of the inhalational agent like sevoflurane. You can administer bronchodilators, administer propofol or ketamine, do suctioning of the ET tube if there is any secretion, give bronchodilator through ET tube, 8 to 10 puffs can be given. You can also give intravenous epinephrine, 5 to 10 microgram per 5 to 10 micrograms, and intravenous steroids can also be given. Still, if the bronchospasm is not relieved, get an ABG done. Some people also use Heliox which is a mixture of Helium and Oxygen which can help. Finally as a last resort, you should have Veno Venus ECMO must be prepared as a backup plan for refractory bronchospasm. Got it? Once the surgery is over, it is your individual choice whether to extubate or put the patient on ventilator in ICU which will obviously depend upon the patient condition and intraoperative events how difficult was the intubation all right so now for pain management coming to narcotics morphine and meperidine are usually avoided because they can cause histamine release and fentanyl can be safely used but anyways opioids dose should be minimal to avoid respiratory depression post operatively coming to the last part that is post operative care maintain oxygen saturation between 88 and 92 percent in copd patients there is no need to administer high flows of oxygen to get that 100% saturation number on the monitor. Alright, because if this keeping high flows of oxygen may abolish the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and this will cause ventilation perfusion mismatch in these patients and it can still worsen the hypoxia. Clear? So this is uh, this brings us to the end of this session and I hope this session was helpful to you. And if you want us to talk about any other case, you can comment below. We'll come up with more videos in this YouTube channel. So if you haven't subscribed yet, do subscribe and like the video. Share it with your friends and colleagues. See you until next video. Thank you. That's a wrap.